Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you to the organizers for this opportunity. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come here to engage in interdisciplinary studies in such an incredible environment and after being so well fed as well. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you today about uh, a study that we started a number of years ago and some of the preliminary and early results from that and uh, offer also the opportunity to engage further in this particular type of study. Sorry, how do I move forward here? Okay, there we go. So um, I, I'm not a nutritionalist, but I came, I'm a health outcomes uh, based researcher. And a number of years ago, this study by uh, Bob Black and colleagues caught my eye. Uh, it's a map of the world which looks at mortality uh, done by the Child Health Epidemiology Ref Reference Group. And frequently, a lot of diseases are categorized around the world as being a cause of, um, in early childhood, from respiratory, malaria, diarrhea, other particular causes. And the WHO frequently has advocacy groups who are vying for their disease as being more important than others. And the reality is, we really don't know. Uh, we have, all of these are estimates. However, if we look at these estimates and we look at the categorization of disease classes, we can see that at the time that this was done, and this is a number of years old and there are new estimates that superimposed on the diarrhea and respiratory, malaria, HIV, others is malnutrition. And whether or not this malnutrition uh, attributable factor is 54%, 30%, whatever it might be, it's a big number. And it caught my eye because the reality is, is that children don't necessarily die from one cause or another, but from a constellation of, of insults to the body. And malnutrition was an interesting component because what is malnutrition in the developing world? Is it food insecurity? Is it the type of food? Is it what is delivered? Um, is it what is absorbed? And um, I became particularly interested in this particular number because whatever it is, there must be multiple factors involved. And as an epidemiologist, we like to go by something called Sutton's Law. Willie Sutton was a bank robber, and they asked him, why do you rob banks? And he answered, well, that's where the money is. And in this particular case, if you have such a high degree of morbidity and mortality due to malnutrition, what's the cause? What's, what's the underlying factors behind this? So at the time, uh, being agnostic and not having any particular favorite disease, I work in vaccine preventable diseases, but I didn't have a favorite of malaria or diarrhea or respiratory. Um, I was involved with the Gates Foundation in terms of they wanted an ag agnostic view of what was important, what was the causes of disease and mortality in under five uh, children. And they developed something called the Global Health Diagnostics Forum to try to look at uh, diseases. And one of the, the task forces involved was diarrhea. Now, you don't need a diagnostic for diarrhea. It's readily apparent if it's there or not. But what was more interesting than just simply diarrhea and what was the, the cause of mortality was more so what was the cause of morbidity related to diarrheal diseases. And more so than just simply diarrhea, but expanding that definition more to enteric diseases and enteric infections. What was causing the diarrhea? More important, what was causing uh, disease over longer term, and are there particular diagnostics that could be developed to look at this particular uh, entity? So if we looked at a systems approach to evaluate health outcomes, which are potentially amenable to public health measures, we have to ask ourselves, what is the burden from the disease, in this particular case diarrhea, but expanded to enteric dysfunction? What's the mortality, morbidity? What's acute? What's chronic? Can we make simple extrapolations from one population to another? What's the distributional change over time? Frequently, advocates for diarrhea were citing studies for 30 years ago. And uh, China 30 years ago is very different from China today. That you can't simply extrapolate diseases, um, etiologic agents of Shigella, whatever, cholera, whatever, from India from 30 years ago to different populations of India today. 
there's been development, quite a bit of development, especially in m most parts of the South. Um, so what is the changing distribution over time? What is it that we know? What is it that we know that we don't know? And finally, what is it that we don't know about what we don't know? And how do we evaluate a syndromic disease such as diarrhea or enteric dysfunction? Can we try to develop more qualitative and quantitative assessments of nutritional factors and enteric uh, infections regarding enteric disease and its impact on health and welfare? So this meeting is and some of the earlier talks by Ken, uh, yesterday Ken Brown talking about clinical uh, studies that might, we might be able to develop was addressed a number of years ago by trying to solve the global health inequities, looking at enteric infections, diarrhea, and their impact and function and development, as well as looking at new challenges in studying nutritional disease interactions in the developing world. And although we tend to uh, categorize these different types of diseases, they're all interrelated, ultimately. Now, there have been a number of classic studies by Leonardo Mata and, and, and others in the early 60s looking at growth and development over time and as a function of multiple insults in early childhood due to respiratory and di uh, bronchitis, uh, diarrheal Ill illnesses and food insecurities, looking at these longitudinal community studies of the, of the host and looking at environmental factors responsible for disease. And we've come a long way since then in terms of our ability to tease out some of these etiologic agents that have uh, uh, resulted in some of these associations. Another interesting studies that have been done was by Robert Fogel, a Nobel Prize winning economist, who looked at BMI and life expectancy over time. And some of you might be familiar with this study, which looks at BMI and, and how he looks at basically uh, mortality curves. And over time, that the, the greater the, uh, one achieves in terms of height, uh, there is a decrease in mortality. So if we talk about, talk about the public health significance of growth overall, uh, approximately 26% of children worldwide are stunted. Uh, stunting is an underlying cause of about 17% of mo child mortality. And again, these numbers are sometimes a little bit fluffy, but it's still a big number. What are the long-term associations with stunting? Are there uh, associated decreased economic activities? Is there impaired cognitive development? What is chronic diseases at older ages? And again, many of these issues are very difficult to study, but if we got a better handle on the actual qualitative and quantitative measures, we can potentially look at greater investments at an early age. So a number of years ago, in 2008, we launched something called the Malnutrition Enteric Disease Study, which was a platform to decipher the relationship amongst enteric infections, gut physiology, and malnutrition, and their effects on child growth development and vaccine response. This was to be an observational study and supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as the NIH and to generate hypotheses to evaluate risk factors and the, the degree of associations of enteric infections, diarrhea, gut physiology, malnutrition on vaccine response and development. So we decided to look at populations where there was adequate field, laboratory, clinical, and data research researchers, as well as a disease burden. We concentrated very much in South Asia, in Nepal, India, uh, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. And these were not countrywide associations. These were specific sites that were not necessarily representative of the country, but more representative of certain types of populations. We also looked at Tanzania, South Africa, Brazil, and Peru. And the sites were selected on the basis of whether or not they were urban, rural, riverine, uh, 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 populations so that we can extrapolate to similar type of populations. And given the fact that enteric diseases and enteric infections are very environmentally driven, 
we, we chose these sites on the basis of, um, again, variations of environmental determinants, climat climatological issues, as well as degree of exposures, and we recruited across time as well, so we, we would eliminate seasonal effects. Some of our hypotheses and research questions were to look at uh, the exposures and longitudinal measurements of illness, symptoms, enteric infections, the social environmental factors, nutrient uh, intake, and looking at outcome measurements of growth by uh, weights and length, uh, cognitive development, and the response to vaccines, as well as attributable effects of mainly gut function and gut physiology but also looking at GWAS and the microbiome as well. So there have been descriptions of a disease state called environmental enteropathy, sometimes referred to as Peace Corps gut, where, where healthy individuals would travel to a place with a lot of environmental exposure to pathogens. And basically what you see on the left are the uh, microvilli of the gut, which is the absorptive surface of the gut, which is equivalent to about the surface area of a tennis court. And what you see after repeat potential infections, a, um, a repavement and a blunting of those absorptive surfaces, which then block the potential absorption of nutrients and potentially growth. The problem is, is that this has been ill-defined in infants. Uh, mostly for ethical is issues and, and the ability to do um, adequate uh, biopsies at an early age. Now, as mentioned before, we believe that food insecurity in and of itself was not the main reason for, in, uh, for poor growth. We believe that the gut physiology actually changes as well during these particular areas. So how can we effectively, adequately measure these particular factors across time and space. Our, our hypothesis was to look at diarrhea and enter, enteropathogens and to look at the insidious effects of these enteropathogens across time, looking at the impact on enteropathy, on growth, cognition, immunity, and whether or not behaviors such as uh, it, changing of feeding patterns, nutrition, or wash, water and sanitation and hygiene projects can actually mitigate this, poten this potential cycle. We don't necessarily even believe that it's a, a cycle. It could be uh, factors which are influencing each other across the board, not necessarily in a circuitous route. So to undertake this particular study, we collected blood, urine and stool over the course of 24 months initially and then expanded it out to 60 months following these uh, infants and toddlers twice a week, getting histories, trying to capture every single diarrhea episode, uh, collecting blood at 7 and 15 months to assay for uh, hemoglobin, ferritin, zinc, vitamin A levels, um, and other particular factors, looking at urines to, uh, at 3, 6, 9, and 15 months, to look at the gut integrity utilizing a lactulose uh, mannitol permeability test as well as looking at iodine and then collecting stool every month as well as every single diarrhea uh, episode and assaying it for 58 different unique pathogens. Um, and that in and of itself became an interesting exercise in terms of measuring and comparing the monthly stool specimens compared to diarrhea and changing our whole concept of what we call it an infection. We also looked at myeloperoxidase, neopterin, and alpha-1 antitrypsin, which are uh, biomarkers or potential biomarkers for inflammatory conditions of the gut. And then also subjected uh, our individuals to a daily recall of, um, of uh, illness, looking also at height and weight, head circumference, comprehensive diets, cognitive functional tests, uh, demographic SES surveys, household maternal assessments, as well as looking at the incidence of uh, uh, other particular factors of illness, antimicrobial usage, and breastfeeding and supplemental uh, diet patterns. <laughs> 
Our analysis allowed us to look at over 2,000 individuals, uh, approximately 250 per site of the eight sites, and it allowed us to analyze these individuals uh, on the individual level, by site, and the entire cohort. And what I'll present to you today is some of the results of those particular studies at various different levels of analysis. All in all, this study resulted in, in over 16 million data points, and uh, we like to refer to this study as almost the Framingham study of the gut, uh, a longitudinal study that allows for investigators from around the world to potentially review the, this type of study. And the cohort is still being followed, and the data is available also in the public domain. So just for example, we're able to collect data looking at exclusive breastfeeding practices. This, this just shows 50 children at one particular site. But more important, it shows the fall off of exclusive breastfeeding practices by day uh, by particular site. And you can see that in some sites, such as in Pakistan, the uh, breastfeeding practices, exclusive bre breastfeeding practices, almost diminish uh, from day one due to the practice of administering, for cultural reasons, uh, solid foods almost at birth. And that's important because it potentially introduces uh, enteropathogens at that point as well into uh, a newborn gut. This shows, for example, a repeat of what uh, Leo Ma Leonardo Mata and colleagues had shown in, in the earlier studies done in Central America looking at the growth curves of individuals, and here you see the growth curve o over time and the WHO standards as a function of uh, antibiotic use, ORS, diarrhea, bloody diarrhea, vomiting, as well as uh, a respiratory illness and fever. Now, here we actually also see a results of, of that, those curves with a higher degree of resolution looking at both diarrhea and monthly stool specimens and plotting out, for example, on a single individual, uh, the Campylobacter, uh, e different types of E. coli, rotavirus, uh, Giardia, Crypto, Spiridium, uh, as well as Shigella. So we have both toxin and non-toxin type of bacteria as well as viruses and other parasites that we literally plot out for every single stool specimen over the course of the first uh, 24 months of life. And you can see in this particular individual the fall off of the curve uh, quite early. We have the pathogen detection, for example, in one particular child. And what you see here is that as you go along uh, in the course of the first 12 months of life, uh, the monthly stool specimens show a significant amount of pathogens despite the fact that you do not see uh, any diarrhea. So asymptomatic uh, infections, if we call them infections, or colonization of some of these organisms, and also then repeatedly finding it uh, month after month. So despite following these individuals for twice a week for the first two years of life, we thought that we might have something called the Hawthorne effect, where we might effectively be preventing the stunting just simply by high degree of observation. However, we did not find that. And what you see here is actually almost 50% of the population, each of these, uh, actually seven of the eight sites, had almost 50% stunting, as measured by less than uh, two, um, a z-score of less than two. Um, so again, despite the high degree of follow-up, we still had a, quite a bit of stunting. This shows it by month. The one exception is Brazil. And those of you who know Brazil, this, the particular site is in Fortaleza, Brazil, which is uh, a city. Um, Brazil is probably almost an order of magnitude more wealthy than most of these other countries. And effectively, despite the fact that Brazil historically had stunting, it no longer seems to be a problem, at least in our population during this time period. And this just shows that development to a large extent can mitigate effectively the malnutrition. But you do see though in sites such as Tanzania where, where you have a small amount of stunting at, at, at relatively a small amount, you still get over 50% stunting by 24 months despite the ob uh, close observation. 
this slide here shows some of the analysis of uh, the cumulative and percent positive of stool specimens for each of the types of organisms that we've assayed. And of note, you see of particularly high elements of percentage of positive of uh, norovirus, giardia, EAC, or enteroaggregate E. coli, as well as Campylobacter, and uh, quite a bit of percent positive findings in uh, the pool data from all eight sites. If we look and dis look at uh, disassociating it by month, as well as by diarrhea versus monthly stools, what you see of note of particular interest is that while diarrhea is, you have more isolates of pathogens than non-diarrheal, you still see a fair amount of pathogens in the monthly uh, non-diarrheal specimens. And that changes our whole concept and idea of actually what is a pathogen that's associated with diarrhea versus a pathogen which is associated with other manifestations of health at an early age. Um, so you see high degrees of Campylobacter, of note Giardia in some cases at 12 to 24 months seems to be protective against diarrhea, you, where you have actually higher levels of Giardia in the monthly stools than you do in the diarrheal stools. So what is normal? And this shows just simply the number of pathogens that are detected in monthly stools by age and by site, and uh, of particular note, some of the, some of the areas have, uh, you see the, the, the unequal distribution, of course, by site, and of course, there are different pathogens by site. Many of these organisms are environmentally determined. This shows the height for age z-score at six months, and at the first month of, li of life for each dot represents uh, the number of pathogens in, in the first six months. And uh, some of these individuals had over 25 pathogens associated with them. And you can see just a, a rough idea that m most of these individuals have a decreased uh, height um, at the first and the six month mark. So trying to integrate all of this particular data into one study has been a bit of a challenge uh, for all of us over the last number of years in trying to look at nutritional uh, effects, uh, microbiological effects, micronutrient effects. And, uh, but some things were, have clearly been uh, able, we were able to ascertain. For example, the number of, of pathogens clearly has an indication on a decrease in length for, length for age z-score. Of particular note also is uh, Campylobacter, which came out uh, surprisingly high as well. And breaking this down into the particular, uh, particular field sites, we can see that high diarrhea and pathogens and low complementary food had the greatest impact for all the particular sites in terms of the difference from the average estimated uh, z-score, uh, followed by some other particular factors such as the high diarrhea and number of pathogens and the high number of pathogens as in general have been pretty consistent. Uh, we also looked, of course, at the weight for average z-score uh, as well. So while stunting was a particular interesting manifestation and health outcome of interest, we also were particularly interested in other particular factors such as vaccine response, so the response to mucosal and parental vaccines, as well as cognition. Um, for this particular part of the study, we're only collecting uh, in the first 24 months of life, and it's establishing a baseline of the, of the social and development as well of, as cognitive development. What will be more interesting is when we're coming out with the five-year study, which will look at the change of time over the first five years in comparison to the first uh, two years as well.
but the importance of the particular study is to show that cognition, not only stunting, but, but cognitive development is a health outcome of particular keen interest as, as it relates to, uh, again, these associations between pathogens as well as exposures to uh, uh, micronutrient disorders, et, et cetera, in early life. So some of the major outcomes to date from the MALED study is uh, less than 5% of the children at six of the eight sites are fed according to the WHO recommendations for exclusively breastfeeding to six months of age. At several sites, it's common practice to expose neonates to solid foods, which is potentially introducing uh, interesting uh, mi microbes at an early age. The quality of the early complementary food diet is low in diversity. Uh, with regards also to vitamin A and iron source foods. Approximately 50% of the children had a mean to length uh, for age Z score less than minus one during the first month of life. And despite the intense follow up, 23 to 70% at each of the sites were stunted with a Z score less than minus two at 24 months in seven of the eight sites. Brazil, as mentioned earlier, uh, has normalized according to WHO standards. The differences in the patterns of diarrheal illness and specific pathogens were seen uh, commonly rotavirus and um, uh, Shigella toxin producing ETEC, Shigella cryptosporidium were commonly found. Uh, unexpectedly, we found Campylobacter and Astrovirus and uh, Norovirus, which was a relatively high prevalence. There was a high incidence of carriage without diarrhea. Diarrhea in and of itself did not appear to be associated with linear growth in children, but the pathogen load did. Nutritional factors may also have the synergistic effects. Seems to be stuck. Uh, we did look at gut permeability and immunology and physiology demonstrated that lactulose mannitol, previously thought about as the gold standard of gut permeability, was not consistently associated with growth faltering, at least in our particular studies. However, other measures of gut function with three other biomarkers, alpha-1 antitrypsin, neopterin, and myeloperoxidase were associated with growth faltering. And this was uh, published by Margaret Kosek and colleagues uh, a few years ago. In summary, the MALED study was designed to advance biomedical knowledge for public health action and intervention related to nutrition. Uh, to try to elucidate the attributable causes of under five mortality and morbidity, and to define further the, our gaps of knowledge. The data sets that we've developed could be utilized for additional add-on future studies, and some of those have already been complete for uh, GWAS, genome-wide associated studies, as well as uh, um, microbiome studies. Uh, there is increased in capacity and development of field sites in resource-poor settings for harmonious multidiscipline studies of under five mortality, and these cohorts are still being followed today and could potentially be used in the future um, to look at chronic diseases. Um, we developed tools to evaluate disease burden distributions and therefore interventions for public health policy. And uh, Ken Brown had elucidated some of those issues earlier on, that the need for some of these particular studies. So with that, I'd like to thank my colleagues at uh, uh, the Foundation for the NIH, uh, at all the field sites, and for all our study participants, as well as those at the NIH and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for supporting this study. Thank you.